Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will begin. Lord, that is our song of prayer to you. How great you are, O God. Your name is above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And Lord, our hearts cry out to you, how great is our God. May we always be a people who understand that you are our master and that we do not seek to put ourselves under anybody or anything else. We don't want to be slaves to sin. We want to be slaves to you, to righteousness. We pray for your blessings now in our time that you would teach us by your spirit your wonderful truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 23 as we continue our uh, verse-by-verse chronological study through the Kings. We're almost finished. (laughs) And when we finish, we will see that the southern kingdom of Judah was finished, (laughs) taken into exile uh, by the Babylonians. But we're not quite there yet. Uh, Today we're going to talk about uh, another one of Josiah's sons. His name was Jehoiakim. Um, Here in Croatia, we've seen certain people who have sold their souls into slavery, right? Sold their souls to the devil. There are certain people in our government who have done that. Other people in the community who have done that. Business, Business, absolutely. But it's not just here in Croatia. It's happened many times in the United States where people have sold their souls looking to find wealth or fame or whatever it may be. And in doing so, they sold their souls to the devil. In fact, as we look throughout history, we've seen people who have done that, right? Well, today we're going to see one of Josiah's sons, Jehoiakim, who sold his soul. He sold his soul to two different world powers at the time. And we're going to see how actually he had sold his soul to the devil and became a slave to sin. Let's read our text for today. Starting in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 36, we read that Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Zebedah. She was the daughter of Pedaah. She was from Rumah. And he, Jehoiakim, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his predecessors had done. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 24, we continue. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land. And Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and he rebelled. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. As for the other events of Jehoiakim's reign and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors, and Jehoiakim, his son, succeeded him as king. And we're told that the king of Egypt did not march out from his own country again because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the Wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates River. 
Did you learn a lot about Jehoiakim? <laughs> Not much, huh? <laughs> well, there's a lot. There's a lot. And that's why we always want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Okay? And if you're taking note, we're going to break it down into three parts here. Uh, looking at uh, Jehoiakim. We're going to look at number one, Jehoiakim. He was a what? Slave to Egypt. That's going to be verses 36 and 37 of chapter 23. We're then going to see how Jehoiakim sold his soul to somebody else. And he became a slave to Babylon. That's going to be chapter 24, verses 1 through 4 and verse 7. And then ultimately we're going to see that Jehoiakim, number 3, really became a slave to sin. It's going to be chapter 24, verses 5 and six. You see the big theme here? Jehoiakim sold his soul to anyone he thought could help him. Well, let's take a look at point number one, how Jehoiakim was a slave to Egypt. Verses 36 and 37, you guys can underline some words here. We read that Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, underline king. And he reigned in Jerusalem how many years? 11 years. Go ahead and underline 11 years. His mother's name was Zebedah, daughter of Padiah. She was from Rumah. Now let's stop there. Let me give you a little background here. Okay. We're told, number one, that Jehoiakim became king of Judah, the southern part of Israel, right? The northern kingdom had already been taken into exile, right? In, in uh, 722 B.C. by the Assyrians, all that was left was Judah. But Judah was quickly, quickly, quickly degrading and getting ready to be taken into exile by the Babylonians. Well, we see here that Jehoiakim became king. And just so you know, he was actually the 18th king of the southern part of Judah. The northern part. Remember when Israel was a united kingdom? It reached its zenith height first under King David, and then Solomon. And then remember after Solomon, the kingdom split? The once united kingdom became a divided kingdom. You had the ten tribes of the north and the two tribes of the south. Well, both the northern and southern kingdoms, before they were taken into exile, they, both, they each had 20 kings. The northern kingdom had 20, the southern kingdom, okay? Total of 40 kings after the kingdom was divided. Well, we're here in Judah, we're now told that Jehoiakim became king. He was the 18th king. That tells you how many were left before the exile. Just two, right? Well, just a point of note, Jehoiakim, again, was the son of Josiah. Josiah was the 16th king of Judah. Who was the other good king we studied? Hezekiah. He was the 13th king. That's just a side note for you, okay? We also know something else about Jehoiakim, he reigned 11 years. The dates up there are very important. 609 to 598 BC. Now, watch. It was during Jehoiakim's reign that the Assyrian Empire was destroyed and the Babylonian Empire rose to prominence. It was also during the reign of Jehoiakim that the Babylonians started to attack Judah and started to take some of the people of Judah back to Babylon. A few of those people you're probably familiar with. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And also, it was during this time of Jehoiakim's reign that the prophet Jeremiah was very instrumental, sent by God to, to talk to Jehoiakim to bring him back to his senses. But we're going to see he didn't come back to his senses. Okay? We also know something else about Jehoiakim. He was the second oldest son of Josiah. Let's just look at that one more time. Again, to get the understanding, go back to, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 3. We looked at this last week. I think it's just good to keep you reminded of this because these names kind of just blend. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. We see the sons of Josiah. 
the last great king of Judah. Uh, we see his first son, Jehonan, the firstborn. Again, we don't know much about him. We see his second son. What was his name? Jehoiakim. Then Zedekiah. And then the youngest was Shalom. Remember, we learned about him last week. His name was Jehoaz. He actually became the first king after his daddy, Josiah. Shouldn't have been because he was the youngest. But who put him in the place? The people. And again, we're not certain, but we believe what may have happened, Jehoiakim, who should have been next in line, because again, we don't know much about Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim maybe got a little jealous that his youngest brother got put in that position. And again, we don't know for certain, but some theologians think that Jehoiakim, it's not out of Jerusalem, went to Nico. Remember Nico, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt? who was up here in Carchemish with the Assyrians trying to fend off the Babylonians. Uh, some theologians believe that Je uh, Jehoiakim actually went to Nico and said, hey, if you hear the news, my youngest brother is now king. The people put him in place, and the people own him. He's a puppet, and guess what? The people are saying to my brother, take out Pharaoh Nico. And theologians believe that maybe Jehoiakim said, hey, let's make a deal, Pharaoh Nico. I'll tell you where my brother is. Can you make me king? Interesting, huh? Not too many things new under the sun, are there? <laughs> not, not a good brother. Right, not a good brother, right? Well, we're going to see also, we're going to meet him briefly today. After Jehoiakim dies, one of his sons also became king. His name was Jehoiakim. I know it's confusing, but I'm just trying to give you the background. Let's go back to 2 Kings, all right? So we see a little bit here about Jehoiakim, all right? But there's more we learn about Jehoiakim. Now it gets interesting. He was chosen as king by Pharaoh Necho. And remember, we discussed it. Let's just look up at the scripture real quick. Remember, verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 34? After Pharaoh Necho took out Jehoaz... He made, key word, you can underline that, Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in his place. And he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. So not only we see two things here. Number one, he was chosen as king by a pagan king, showing that Nico was in authority of that region. And not only that, Nico changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Once again, a sign of authority. In other words, what Nico was saying in Judah, hello, I'm the Lord of Judah. And here we see Jehoiakim was a slave to Egypt. And how bad of a slave was he? Well, he had to tax his own people to pay Pharaoh Nico. Look at verse 35. Jehoiakim paid Pharaoh Necho the silver and gold he demanded. Another, an, another sign of authority when a vassal country and king have to pay the conquering king. You know how he got the money? He taxed the land. He stressed the people so bad. He exacted gold and silver from the people. Many of those people who had probably put his brother in place earlier. And you know well, what else Jehoiakim did? While the people were being stressed and oppressed because of this heavy tax on, by Nico, Jehoiakim decided to build something. A place where poor people could go get food, right? A place where the poor people could go get the clothing because they were being taxed so much. No. You know what Jehoiakim did? He decided to build his own palace probably from some of, some of the money that he was collecting taxes from. Let's just look and see what that says there. Go real quick to Jeremiah. Remember, he's the key prophet here. We're going to see a lot of him today. Go to Jeremiah 22. Now, we believe, we looked at this last week, we believe that Jehoaz also was starting to build his own pass, uh, palace. The problem is Jehoaz only led for how long? Three months. Well, guess what? When his brother took over. <laughs> Look at verse 13. God says, woe to him who built his palace by what? 
Unrighte- By the way, God was saying this about, look at verse 11, about Shalom, son of Josiah. He was also saying this, look at verse 18, about Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for what? Nothing. Not paying them for their labor. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. So he makes large windows and it panels with cedar and decorates it in red. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar, God asks? Did not your father, referring to Josiah, have food and drink? He did what was right and just. So all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and needy. And so all went well with him. Is that not what it means to know me, God asked? But God said, he had said it to Jehoaz, he was saying it also to Jehoiakim. Your eyes and your heart are set only on what? Dishonest gain. On shedding innocent blood. And on oppression and extortion. Back to 2 Kings. So you get a picture of our friend Jehoiakim. He didn't care that he was a slave to Egypt. He sold his soul. Hey, I get to be called king. I don't care that he changes my name. Sure, I'll tax the people because it's going to be more for me. I can build my own palace. Do you see what happens when you sell your soul and become a slave to somebody else? But it's interesting. Jehoiakim didn't learn his lesson. God had sent the prophet Jeremiah saying, what are you doing, Jehoiakim? You're building, woe to you. You're building your palace with unrighteousness. You're not taking care of your own people. You're stressing and oppressing them by taxing them because you sold your soul to the Egyptian king, Nico. Well, you know what ended up happening to our friend Jehoiakim? The good news was that Egypt collapsed in terms of being a power. The bad news? Jehoiakim decided to sell his soul to the next guy at top, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Chapter 24, starting in verse 1. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, I don't mind Babylon, invaded the land. And Jehoiakim became his, underline this word, vassal for how many years? Three years. Stop. Here we go. Let's do a little history lesson. Remember, do you guys remember when Josiah died? Do you know what year it was? I only taught about Josiah for like 15 weeks. <laughs> he died in 609 BC. Why is that an important date? Because that, if you remember, is when the king of Assyria was panicking. His name was Ashur Ubital, last king of Assyria. Remember, he called upon his buddy, Pharaoh Nico of Egypt, hey, come help me. He was in Carchemish, okay? That was like the new and last uh, capital city of Assyria because Nineveh, three years earlier in 612 BC, had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Babylonians, he was just coming. They destroyed Nineveh in 612. Many of the Assyrians ran and took up, made their headquarters Carchemish. Well, Babylonians kept coming. It's 609 B.C. Assyria calls on Pharaoh Necho, come help. Remember Pharaoh Necho marched with his army through parts of Judah? Remember Josiah went out to intercept Pharaoh Necho? Josiah died. Well, it was there in 609, okay, that the battle started. The coalition of Egypt and Assyria against the Babylonians. And there was a prince... His name was Nebuchadnezzar. His dad, Napolassad, was the guy who founded the Babylonian Empire. Well, Napolassar sent his son Nebuchadnezzar, crown prince, to go take out this Egyptian and Assyrian coalition. So, for a couple years, 609, boom. 608, boom, 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 boom. 605 BC, boom, Assyria was done. 
Now you've got Babylon, the world power. Well, guess what? All the countries that had been under Assyria or Egypt, like Judah, guess who now their master was? Babylon. So we read here that when Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon, he invaded the land. Judah had a choice, fight or sell their soul. What did Jehoiakim do? We read, he became a what? Vassal. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Huh? Sure, whatever. I paid, oh, I paid Nico. I'll pay you. I know how to. I'll just keep taxing the people. Just please don't touch my palace. And Jehoiakim became a vassal or a slave to Nebuchadnezzar. We can see, see it everywhere. There's nothing new under the sun. Now it's interesting what happened. The Egyptians, oh, by the way, you can just read. That's why we read in verse 7, the king of Egypt did not march out from his own country again. Do you understand why? Because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the Wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates River. Now, do you understand the context? But let me tell you what ended up happening. A couple years later, in 601 BC, Egypt decided, ah, oh, I'm sorry. I, gave, I told you that I didn't, I didn't, I went too fast. Let's stop. Let's forget that part. I'll go to that in a second. Nebuchadnezzar took over, right? And one of the things the Babylonians started doing was choosing the best looking men. Young men, not old men, young men. Guys like you. Smartest guy, not all of you, but anyway. <laughs> men of nobility. You know what they would do? They would take them back to Babylon where they would train them to be good Babylonian men. Keep your finger, let's go look at some of them. Go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, right after Ezekiel. Yeah. Starting in verse 1, let's read about some of these men. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These, Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put it in his treasure house of God. That was around 605 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and as God had prophesied and said, because of Manasseh, God says, this city, even my house, are going to be taken away. And we see Nebuchadnezzar went into the temple and started taking back some of the gold from the temple took it to Babylon. But he didn't just take some of the gold. He took some of the finest young men. Then the king ordered Asphanaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service and be good Babylonians. Well, who were some of these men who were taken from Judah? Well, we read in verse 6, those who were chosen, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Well, guess what happened? They were given new names. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, his name became Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Michel, Michel Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Back to 2 Kings. So you see what the Babylonians did, right? So... 605 was a very key year 
Okay, Egypt went down, Babylon up, and Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem. Not only did he take stuff from the temple of God and take it back to Babylon, not only did he take some of the people of God and take them back to Babylon, Jehoiakim sold his soul. Instead of protecting God's house, instead of protecting God's people, Jehoiakim said, oh, okay, I'll be your vassal. How much you got to pay? Let me give you a little principle. You sell your soul once, it gets easier and easier to do it after that. It gets easier and easier to do it. If you sell your soul the first time, it's always hardest the first time, it gets a lot easier after that. And that's what happened with Jehoiakim. But then guess what happened? Oh, you'll like this. This is the part I was getting into. A couple years later, Egypt decided to, okay, we're tired of not being the world power. So Egypt said, you know what? We're going to try to go against Babylon. Well, that didn't work so well. Nebuchadnezzar and his army came down. And even though Egypt put up a good fight, they couldn't do anything. But it's very interesting what happened. We read here in, verses one and two, in verse 1 of chapter 24 that after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, Jehoiakim became his vassal, right? We know that, slave. But then look what happened. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and what? Rebelled. You know why he rebelled? Because he saw Egypt was actually surviving against the Babylonian attack. And he said, you know what? Let me, let me sell my soul again. And he sought help and he provided support for the Egyptians. Well, how, how, how do you think that turned out? Verse 2. The Lord sent Babylonian and Aramean Moabite and Ammonite raiders against Jehoiakim to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely we're told these things happen to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence. Why? Because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was what? Not willing to forgive. So we see Jehoiakim sold his soul, first of all, I believe, by selling out his brother. Sold his soul to Pharaoh Necho. Then sold his soul, soul to Nebuchadnezzar. Didn't protect the people, didn't protect God's house. Kept building his palace. Didn't listen to the prophet Jeremiah. And then when he thought in 601 B.C., maybe the Egyptians have a chance, he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Egypt, would you please help me? Well, guess what? Egypt couldn't help him. And not only did God send foreign nations to come and pound on Judah, you know what Nebuchadnezzar ended up doing to our friend Jehoiakim? Keep your finger there. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And let's see the story from the chronicler's perspective. Verse 5. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned. And I'm in chapter 36, by the way. Verse 5. Jehoiakim became, was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil. We know that Hebrew word, rach, in the eyes of the Lord, his God, right? Now watch what happened. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him. We know that. And he became a vassal for how many years? Three years. Then he rebelled. What did Nebuchadnezzar do to him? He bound him with bronze shackles to take him where? To Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple 
there. Look at the screen. Jehoiakim sold his soul back to Egypt, rebelled against Babylon. God sent foreign countries against Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar put our friend Jehoiakim in chains and took him to Babylon. Now, many people believe, many theologians believe that, because the same thing had happened to Manasseh. He had been taken into captivity. In fact, just go to chapter 33 right here. I'll show you. Verse 10, the Lord had spoken to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. Remember Manasseh? He was the, uh, uh, what, the, uh, would have been the 13th, no, 18th, 16th, 15th, 14th king. There you go, 14th king. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner. How? They put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. At that time, Assyria was over Babylon. But look what Manasseh did. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, believe it or not, God forgave him. The Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. But the problem is, verse 17, the people, however, continued to sacrifice at the high places. Even though they say it was to the Lord their God, they were doing idolatry. So we see that Manasseh actually was taken captive by the Assyrians and, w and was returned, and he died in Jerusalem. I believe the same thing happened with our friend Jehoiakim. He had been taken captive into Babylon, but I believe he came back and ended up dying in Jerusalem. How do we know that? Let's go back to 2 Kings and let's just read. Verse 6, Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors. Where would that be? Jerusalem. Make sense? So we see how Jehoiakim had a problem. Selling his soul. Three times. Yeah. So far. We still got one more. He sold his soul first to who? Pharaoh Necho. And then he sold his soul to who? Nebuchadnezzar. And then he went back, as you correctly said, to Pharaoh Necho, right? or to Egypt, um, you want to know who he also sold a soul to? Devil. Yeah, sin. Again, we'll just read it right here. The end of his life, verses 5 and 6. As for the other events of Jehoiakim's reign and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim wrestled with his ancestors. And Jehoiakim, <clears throat> we read about him earlier, his son succeeded him as king. We'll learn about him next week. So you see how we read here how he sold his soul to, to sin? Oh, no, 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 you guys don't see that. It's not written there. Sure it is. Huh? Oh, it's written in the book. Here we go. He did it three times. Yep, he did it three times, but there was a bigger one. Look, look, look. As for the, verse 5, the other events of Jehoiakim's reign, what are the next four words? And all he did. Are they not written? Of course they are. So what are you supposed to do? There you go. Find them. Let's go to Second Chronicles. Let's find them. <laughs> Very good, guys. You're learning. <laughs> Second Chronicles. Let's see. Same story. Verse 8. The other event, chapter 36, verse 8. The other events of Jehoiakim's reign and the what? What's the D word? Detestable things he did. Now you're getting a picture. In 2 Kings we saw all the things. Now it's getting narrowed down. They were what kind of things? Detestable things. Wow. We know that he sold a soul to Pharaoh Necho, to Nebuchadnezzar, to the Egyptians again. What other detestable things? But Gagi, aren't they written? David, what are we supposed to do? 
Find them. What are some of the detestable things that he did? Look on the screen. Uh, yeah, he persecuted the prophet Jeremiah, who spoke the words of the Lord. Let's go to Jeremiah. We're going to leave here now. We're going to stay in Jeremiah a few minutes. Let's go check out, because Jeremiah was the main prophet at that time. Go to Jeremiah chapter 26. Let's see what Jehoiakim tried to do to Jeremiah, what was so detestable. Starting in verse 1. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. He's talking to Jeremiah the prophet. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house. Remember what was happening at the Lord's house at that time, right? Nebuchadnezzar's taking gold out of it, right? Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in this house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will what? Listen, and each will turn from their evil ways. Do you see God's mercy? God said, then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they've done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh in this city a what? A curse among the nations of the earth. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. Obviously, the king would have heard it too. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded them to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people with the authority of the king, what they do? Seized him and said, you must what? Die. That's interesting. You see some of the detestable stuff that Jehoiakim did? The Lord's prophet who came with the Lord's word, the word to say, would you please relent? Quit selling your soul to, to, to sin? Can you yeah. I'm willing to forgive. Yeah. And what was Jehoiakim's response? Kill him. Oh, it gets better. There was another prophet. His name was Uriah. Guess what? Jeremiah didn't get killed. God protected Jeremiah. But Uriah, this other prophet, let's read about him. Right there in verse 20. Now Uriah, son of Shemaiah, from kiriath Yiram, was a man, another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord. He prophesied the same things against this city and against the land as Jeremiah did. When King Jehoiakim and all his officers and officials heard his words, the king was determined to what? Put him to death. But Uriah heard of it and he fled where? In fear to Egypt. But guess what Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim did? He sent some men after Uriah. They brought Uriah out of Egypt, took him to King Jehoiakim, who had struck him down, who had him struck down with a sword and his body thrown into the burial place of common people. Do you see the detestable things Jehoiakim was doing? He didn't just build a palace while he was taxing the people. He didn't just sell his soul to Egypt or to Babylon and then Egypt again. The Lord mercifully sent his prophets to Jehoiakim and said, would you listen to my words? Jeremiah, he tried to kill. Uriah, he killed. Oh, and there was something else he did that was extremely detestable. Go over to chapter uh, 36. Starting in verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a what? Scroll. Watch me. Back then they didn't have this, right? God's word was written on a scroll. And God said to Jeremiah, take a scroll. In other words, it would be like today God saying, take my word, take the Bible, and go talk to this King Jehoiakim. So Jeremiah 
God says, take my scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Those were a lot of words, right? Look what God says. Look at God's merciful heart. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So guess what happens? Jeremiah writes the words of the Lord on the scroll. Jeremiah then gives the scroll to the king's officials so that the words on the scroll would be read to the king. Who was the king? Jehoiakim. Let's see his response, verse 23. Whenever Jehudi, that was one of the king's officials, had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and he threw God's word into a fire pot until the entire scroll was burned with in the fire. Detestable things. He tried to kill one of the Lord's prophets, Jeremiah, who brought the Lord's words to Jehoiakim. He ended up killing another prophet, Uriah, who had brought the words of the Lord to him. And when it came to God's written word on a scroll, He burned the scroll in a fire. Verse 24, the king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes in repentance. Remember how Josiah did? Even though Elnathan, Delilah, Gamadia, these are people next to the king. They're going, you don't need to do this, king. They urged the king not to burn the scroll. He would not listen to them. Instead, the king commanded uh, Jeremiel, the son of the king, Sariah, son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdel, to arrest Barak and the, sc the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord protected him. Can you see how disgusting Jehoiakim was? Do you see how he sold his soul as a slave to sin? And that's why our friend Jehoiakim, you know what happened, how he died? He died in 598. And he had a burial of a what? Donkey. Go to chapter 22. Verse 18 and 19. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about whom? Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my brother, alas, my sister. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my master, alas, his splendor. No, 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 verse 19, he will have the burial of a what? Donkey. Dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. That's why I believe he re obviously returned back from Babylon. He was thrown out on a garbage pile. Because he would not listen to the Lord. Instead, he was willing to become a slave to any other human master. And ultimately, he became a slave to sin. That's his story. What about ours? We have a sin nature, like Jehoiakim did. We are also sinners. We are sinners. Yes, we are. Definitely. All day long. 
But there's good news, Christian. There's good news. There's a Savior. Go to Romans chapter 6. And we'll conclude here. As was correctly said by our friend, we're sinners. And that's because we come to the world with a sin nature. We all have that same nature Jehoiakim had. We don't mind hurting others as long as it makes us better. We will tax the people so we can build our palaces. That's a sin nature. We're the type of people that will sell ourselves to anyone who we think can help us, protect us, or make us better. We'll sell ourselves to Egypt. We'll sell ourselves to Babylon. We'll go back to Egypt. That's because we all have a sin nature like Jehoiakim. You know what? There were many times in our lives when people maybe wanted to share the word with us. And guess what? We wanted to kill them. Like Jehoiakim wanted to kill Jeremiah. Some of us may have killed somebody, at least in our minds or with our words. Some of you maybe with your hands. <laughs> yeah. uh, how about... Many times that we completely ignored the word of the Lord, acting as though we just burned God's word. We wanted nothing to do with it. Friends, we're no different than Jehoiakim. And you know what we all deserve? To be buried like donkeys out on a garbage pile. We deserve to have our souls sent to hell because as you said correctly, we're all sinners. And I'm the worst. But there you go. We have a savior. Praise the Lord the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords came to this earth 2,000 years ago with a royal mission to save sinners like you and me. And God the Son was born of a virgin, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have a sin nature. Lived a perfect life, never sinning once. Didn't build his own palace. We've been learning. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He was put in a, in a, in a, in a, in a I, I can't say it in English. Well, Yasli say I know it in Croatian. <laughs> uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a feeding trough for animals. Didn't have a place to lay his head. But he didn't come here to be comfortable. He came here to save our souls. And how did he do it? He went to that cross. And as he hung there, God the Father in his love for us took our sins, placed them on Jesus, and punished Jesus in our place as our substitute. I mean, think about it. We see God's mercy towards Jehoiakim time and time again. How about God's mercy to us? Because we don't deserve anything better than Jehoiakim. But look what Christ did for us. He was willingly punished on that cross, died the death we deserve. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He overcame sin and death for us. Now watch. Watch what happens now. We're forgiven our sins in terms of that day of judgment, right? We're brought into God's family, right? We have eternal life, right? God the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, right? Now watch. You now have a different master. You're still a slave. But now you're the slave to the one and only perfect master. Let me show you. Paul says in verse 5, if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we've been crucified with Christ, right? We will also certainly be united with him in what? Resurrection. That's good news, isn't it? For we know that our old self was what? Crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin. Might be, a done, might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to what? Sin. Because anyone who has died with Christ has been set what? Free. Free from sin. Sin is no longer your master, Christian. You've been set free. Now you can say no to that desire when you want to build your own palace and oppress the people. Now you can say no to that desire when you don't want to hear God's word. You don't want to humble yourself before God's word. You can say no to that because you're now free. In verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, Christian, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. It's still there. Verse 13, do not offer any part of yourself as, to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of what? Righteousness. Christian, verse 14, this is the key. Sin <coughs> shall no longer be your what? Master. Because you are not under the law, you are under grace. <coughs> Jehoiakim was a slave to sin. And as a result, he was a slave to everyone. Christian, you have been set free. You do not have to be a slave to anybody other than to Christ. You're not interested in living to please people. You're not interested in living to please yourself. You offer the totality of your life to your master, Jesus Christ. He's not an oppressive master. He's not a mean master. He's the perfect master. And if you ever wonder what kind of master he is, look what he did for you. And Christian, you offer yourself every day to him. Master, here I am. I'm your slave. And you don't worry about the Nikos, the Nebuchadnezzars. You don't worry about building your own palaces. You offer your life to him because Christian, now you can. Now you can say no to sin. When that sinful desire starts to come up, that emotional turmoil, guess what? You can say no to it because sin is not your master. You can say no to negative thoughts. You can say no to those feelings. You can say no to it because sin is not your master. You can live for Christ, who is the true King of Kings. You let Him build your life. You let Him lead your life. Because what He will do is not have your life end up on a garbage dump, having a donkey burial. Your life extends all the way through eternity. When God's Word comes to you, and if it's something maybe you don't like, you humble yourself to it. You submit yourself to it because you know this, these are the words of your master. And you live to please him. You give your everything to him. You are his vassal. You are his slave. And Christian, he bought you at a price. His precious blood. Sin shall no longer be your master. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you, King of Kings, so much. That we are united with you. In your crucifixion, your death, your burial, your resurrection. Lord, we're alive with you and we thank you. And Lord, because of that, sin is no longer our master. We can say yes to you and live for you. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would do that every day. And we know, Lord, the way that happens is by being in submission to your word. We don't want to act like Jehoiakim. We don't want to burn your word in the fire. We want to live according to your word, out of gratitude for what you've done for us, Jesus, and saving our souls. Jesus is our joy, our honor, our privilege to call you our master. We are your bond servants. We live for you. We want to bring glory to you. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this honor. And thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. Free indeed. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.